three sutures across. So we put a clip on the end of each of those and then pass a second suture across here with a different coloured material on it. So I might be using Ethibond, which is blue. Um, I'll pass that across, same manner again, pull it through, and then repeat it a third time. So we're ending up with three different coloured sutures that have transfixed the tendon and the skin. Next, you want to pull the, the jig out. So we pull the jig out steadily here, and at this point, when it comes out the wound, I'm now looking at sutures that are going up along this way, through the skin and the fat and the fascia. They then come out and back through my jig. And so I can now pick up those sutures with a pair of forceps, flick them up here, flick them up here, grasp them, and pull the jig away. And I'm then left with three sutures which are coming out of my wound and have gone up inside the wound and across the Achilles tendon. I hope that makes sense to everybody. So I then fold those, tendon, those sutures away and we repeat the process exactly the same the other direction. So often, that Achilles tendon can be just delivered into the wound by simply plantar flexing the foot the Achilles tendon rupture site is then very obvious. Again, grasp it with a clip, use the jig, reverse the procedure this time. So now we're just passing the jig distally down into the wound in exactly the same manner. The jig comes down and often the prongs will come down almost as far as the, the actual calcaneus itself. Make sure that the Achilles tendon is, is within these prongs and that you've, you have indeed got those prongs inside the paratenon. And again, we do exactly the same thing. The jig is now the other way around, of course, so we're going to have to pass the sutures the other direction. But again, it's a passage of three sutures across in exactly the same manner as we did before, passing three stitches across, one, and then two, and then three. And then we pull the jig out again in this manner. We're now looking at three sutures, which have got the same colour as the first sutures, but they're in the opposite order. So if I started with a vicral suture proximally, I'm going to put a vicral suture most distally. And I'm then going to pull the jig away. And so I've now got my three suture ends here, three on each side, that is, and three on each side proximally. And I'm now going to start to tie them together. So simply by providing some tension on one side with your assistant, you can then take the other pair of sutures and you just tie them together. And that will bring the most distal part of the tendon towards itself in the same way as my fingers are now. So it will tend to bring them towards each other. And you then subsequently tie the opposite side and then you do repeat the procedure for the middle suture and you repeat the, su the, the procedure for the, mo the suture closest to the wound. So you end up with um, three sutures that have transfixed the proximal end, three sutures transfixed the distal end and those are tied together. You then have to be very careful that your knots are not all sitting in the wound because otherwise you're going to have six knots all sitting within the wound. So as we go, once I've tied one side, I use the sutures on the other end to pull and that will make that knot disappear up inside the repair site. And you can do the same on the other side with another knot so that your three of your knots at least will end up distal from the wound site. Making sure that those sutures are, are well inside the paratenon, you can then, using your careful skin retraction here, you can repair the paratenon. I think that's an important layer to repair. I tend to repair it with just two um, little uh, absorbable sutures um, just to snug that paratino down to make sure that your Achilles is truly separated from your um, skin. And then we tend to close the skin with a subcuticular dissolvable suture. At this point, your foot is usually in about this much of equinus. And at this point, you can calf squeeze again, and this time you'll find as you squeeze the calf, um, you'll find that you get plantar flexion. Um, at, not, and basically you've re restored Simmons test to being positive. We then apply a simple dressing. I tend to put a gelinet dressing on and then gauze and then velband and then we put a, I put a full cast on, um, a, a fiberglass cast or a plastic cast, it doesn't matter, and just it literally put the cast on with the foot sitting as it will do in that position without any, ap with any application of Aquinas. Exactly as Sampat said before, the idea of pushing this foot into this sort of position and casting it is really out of the window these days. So the foot will just sit pretty much in the position it's doing there, and so that's a gravity Aquinas, that's why we call it gravity Aquinas, and we just apply a full uh, completed below knee cast in that position with some wedges. And often people say, well, how many wedges do you use? And the answer is, you start with enough wedges that that gravity Aquinas is essentially neutral to the ground. So that may be three wedges. And you take the wedges out one, and then two, and then three, 
uh, over a, a period of three or four weeks so that at four weeks the foot is neutral to the ground and at four weeks the patient takes the splint off um, completely and starts mobilizing with physiotherapy exercises. Is that okay? I'm sorry that the video didn't work. Um, has anyone got any questions about that? If I come to the front and ask any questions. Up. So I tend to use one Vicryl suture, one Ethibon suture, and one fiber wire suture. And I know Mark uses something different. I think Mark uses PDS and Vicryl and... Right, Ethibond, Ethylon, and PDS. So it clearly, and we have no difference in our results, so it makes no difference what you use. Um, I think it is useful to try and use a braided suture, although the volume of the suture is greater, the prickliness of the, of the cut ends uh, is a little bit softer with a, with a braided suture. Uh, with a braided suture, there is also less chances of opening of the knot? I think that's true. I don't, I, the suture doesn't have so much memory. Um, I think that's nice. There isn't a problem with the passage. You know, sometimes with a heavy braided suture, through some tissues, it can tear as it passes through. But the needle that we pass it through, being 1.6 mils in diameter, allows a very decent aperture. So there's no tearing of the suture as it passes through transversely. Um, Thank you. Oh, we've got another. So, um, do you think the three sutures that are passed are adequate for the repair of the tendo Achilles? My purpose for asking this is especially the suture that passes near the rupture site that is just above and just below and when you give traction after you've pulled those sutures most often cuts out and when it cuts out what is your next step what do you do do you pass this jig again and pass one more suture or how do you go about it okay so so that's why you need to start with your repair using the most distal sutures away from the rupture site so you always start with the ones furthest away on both the proximal end and the distal end. And that's what, exactly why you're doing that, because those are your bulwark sutures. They're the ones that have got the maximum length of Achilles to actually draw on. So if you use that one first, and then tie it tight, tight, and use the second one and the third one, the third one never tears out. Yes, even I have learned, these, I have learned this tip the hard way after my proximal one has cut out. But that, theoretically, if you look about it, it shows that this, the the third suture is ideally not holding it. The one that is really holding it, just the proximal two ones. Yeah. So uh, ideally, do you feel that there should have been five suture rolls where you put five needles or three is good enough? No, so we've done 160 of these and we've not re-ruptured one of them. Yeah, I agree uh, on and, that. And I think that's, uh, that's all the evidence I can provide you. May, okay. If it had five, maybe it should have 10, 15. No, so, I completely so, agree. So but three, three in our series, three's worked. Okay. So, so three's fine. Okay. Um, the answer to your question, if it pulls out, is to leave it with two. Um, and yes. I've, I've certainly, that, that's happened to me, not that it's pulled out in the proximal one, but that the knot's given way. Okay. So we haven't tied the knot well, and as you tighten it, the knot on the far side gives way, and the suture just comes out in your hands. And, and, and that's happened to me three or four times, I think. I've just left them with two, and uh, again, they've all healed, so it seems to work okay with two. Okay. The other question is like, do you kind of, uh, once they have come together, do you still reinforce it with some sutures, no. or you never do that? Absolutely not. Okay. No. Uh, there's Thank no you. need for that. Thanks a lot. Did you, do you have a question? Sorry, sorry, could you just pop to the microphone? Sir? Sorry. If there is a avulsion from the insertion, then which tactic you, you have used? I'm, so, I'm sorry, can you say that again? The, if there is a avulsion of TA from the insertion site, then which, ta which tactic you have used? Rupture from the... Oh, right, okay, sorry. Sorry. Uh, after a steroid injection, chronic tendonitis, it has evolved off. Okay. What do you do? Right, I think that's a, very, that's a really good question, and it's thankfully something that we don't deal with very often. I have dealt with it only ever twice. And I think that's, it, it was interesting that it came out in the talks this morning that clearly a lot of your patients are having steroid injections, and not many of ours do. Certainly some do. I don't know if your steroid injections have been given under ultrasound guidance. Um, because there's, there's a, a great deal in the literature that intratendinous steroid injections cause a very high rate of rupture, and, and for that reason we don't do it. So, so steroid injections are used very occasionally, but they're very carefully given under ultrasound so that we make sure that the steroid injection is just inside the paratenon and not in the tendon. Shall I answer that question? I Go see it, it very often. See, steroid, usually what you just said happens after a steroid injection, or there is a previous Hagelin's deformity which has caused the degeneration of the tendon. Now, that is a separate entity than what has been described. There, there is degeneration of tendons, so it won't heal even if you repair. 
So it has to be repaired along with FHL tendon transfer to increase the blood supply to make it heal. You can either drill a tunnel in the calcaneum to stitch it or use anchors to repair it. Or we can use a uh, plantaris to reinforce it. Yep, so I think, I think you can use, I, I suspect there is no absolute answer. Uh, the ones that I've done, I've freshened up the Achilles uh, insertion point. I've repaired the Achilles back onto the Achilles uh, insertion point with corkscrew anchors, and then I've done an FHL tendon transfer. And the FHL tendon transfer, uh, exactly as Sampat said, it's a really, really, really useful and very simple transfer to do with, with really no loss of power demonstrably in the patient's push-off uh, and really very little comorbidity behind using that tendon at all. Uh, I did uh, two, three cases. What I did, did I freshened the calcaneum where it is inserted and freshened the TA and then sutured it and reinforced with the stainless steel wire. Uh, and it is put for six months. They are very well. Good, excellent, thank you. Is there any difference in the size of the zig no, of universal, universal uh, uh, I mean universal size? It can be used in any patient. The jig itself, yes, yeah, it, it only comes as one size. Mm. Um, you, there aren't sort of wider jigs. So you're thinking if you had a very, very fat patient, yes, then you might struggle to get the jig in. I agree with that, and I think that's really a very, very good question. It's happened to me once, um, and I couldn't get the jig to work, and I converted the approach to an open approach. Um, but I think if that is a problem you have, you've got an awful lot of brilliant industry in India, I would just make one wider. Thank you. This is a question towards the previous speakers also and to you. Do you ever treat the fresh ruptures conservatively, non-operatively? Yeah, exactly as Mark said really. So uh, what, what we do now with an acute rupture is we'll ultrasound them. And if on an ultrasound the Achilles tendon ends come together, then we'll treat them conservatively in a cast. Uh, and our regimen after put, applying a gra it's still a gravity aquinas cast, but is exactly the same as we do with our operatively managed ones. And our philosophy really is that when you repair the Achilles tendon, all you're doing is bringing the Achilles tendon ends together. You're not providing a powerful repair. You're just bringing the tendon ends together and then biology and nature will make it heal. So if on an ultrasound, those tendon ends come together, then biology will still be in your favor and you treat them the same. So we put them in a gravity aquinas cast for two weeks and then a boot with wedges for two or three weeks and then neutral at six weeks with physiotherapy. Exactly the same in the non-operative and the operative. And what percentage of cases the ends do not come together in on, in an, on an ultrasound? I beg your pardon? Uh, is there a significant number of cases where the ends do not come close yes. together? Yes. Chris and I are debating on this very subject actually on the 6th, so if you're interested, come along. I'm doing the non-operative side of it, and he's doing the operative side, so fists and... Um, Mr. Hari Haran. <coughs> um, I don't okay. know if there's an answer to this question, but uh, if there is overwhelming evidence or emerging overwhelming evidence that there's no difference between operative and non-operative management, why do you want to operate on these at all? Because I, because I don't believe that. Well, if there is overwhelming prospective evidence... But, but there isn't. Well, there isn't, but I'm saying, uh, you know... If there were... If there's if emerging evidence... There is emerging evidence, and we're definitely backing off from the number of Achilles tendons that we're repairing because we're trying to follow the literature. What I'd love to do, and we have tried to do, is change our practice and randomise our patients locally to operative versus non-operative. And we've set up a protocol for that, and we've been told we need to do 2,200 procedures to demonstrate a difference. So uh, I c we can't do that. Would that, so would that. Would that be feasible for a multi-center study? So, well, Maybe with somebody like Sampat? Well, we've looked at that too, and, and there isn't even a flavor for that either, even co coming from Warwick. So the answer to your question is, I think all I can do is try to follow the literature. I might be a little bit behind the curve, and the reason I think I'm a little bit behind the curve is because our results are so excellent with operative management. Yeah. It may be that it's the rehab that gives us the excellent yeah, results, and, that, and that's why we're trying to step back to be a little bit scientific but I'm, I, I agree, but I don't think there's overwhelming evidence no, that says you mustn't operate. Yeah, Harry, uh, just on that line, basically our experience, our default is non-operative in Leicester, and we have prospectively collected yeah. data for 300, 
um, of which we've analyzed 120, which I'll be sort of debating. Well, I mean, I, I've completely gone away so from we could actually operating, compare operating on any Achilles tendons. I, I treat elite professional athletes non-operatively. Yeah. Sometimes they don't agree with me and they go away elsewhere. But the ones that have agreed with my treatment, and I've had no re-ruptures thus far, and I've had no complications thus far. Yeah, great. Um, Chris, uh, uh, Mark has kindly put up a couple of slides there, just as you were demonstrating the uh, sutures. Yeah. Uh, it would be quite nice if you could just take everyone yeah. through, and then we move to the workshop station after yeah. that. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Jit. Thank you, Mark, for loaning me your slides. So, um, this clearly shows you the transverse incision. Uh, Mark's clearly ma marked out here the, the rupture site that you can see, or the ruptured end here. So, this is where we're grasping the uh, Achilles with a clip and pulling the Achilles this way. In fact, in this instance, we've got two clips on the Achilles. Quite often, you need to give, uh, get quite a good hold on that so that as you push the Achillon jig in, you don't push the tendon away from you. So, it's pulling on the clips whilst pushing the jig in. I think everyone understands probably the importance of the fascia cruris versus the paratenon that Mark, this is the same as Mark drew on his, uh, on blackboard. And here we have passing a, a suture across here. Uh, this is the first suture that you would pass, being the most proximal one. And this is what it looks like when you're pulling the jig out. So here we've got our three sutures. So you can see an ethibond, ethylon, and PDS suture. So those three sutures have gone through the skin, all the way across the tendon, and out the other side. And as you pull the jig out, those tendons, the passage of those tendons is like that, through the jig, through the skin, out here in the paratenon. So when you're pulling this here, this tendon here, this suture here, has gone inside the paratenon, round the Achilles, and out the inside the paratenon again here. So if you grab those three sutures there, and those three sutures there, then all you're going to have is three sutures that have transfixed the tendon at the top end. And you repeat that process distally, and you tie them together, and you repair your wound, as Mark showed, with a subcuticular suture. You can see the three little puncture wounds there, and the three little puncture wounds there, three puncture wounds there, and there's three there where that's been carried out. Beautiful repair, doesn't seem to cause problems, and at the end, a Simmons test will demonstrate that you have indeed got tension back within your Achilles tendon. Okay, so with no further ado, if you can gather around the tables, we'll just let you play with the jig and get a feel for how it works. To the huge suffering mass of diabetic foot problem patients. So why should we talk about diabetic foot? 40 million diabetics in India, so we are talking of 80 million feet. And this is going to be doubled by 2020. Diabetic epidemic has already attacked us and WHO has declared us world capital of diabetes. 20 to 25 percent of diabetic population develop foot and ankle problems. Foot ulcerations are the most common cause of hospital admissions for diabetics. And it may lead to costly treatments and even amputation. Why should we talk about diabetic ulcers? 15 percent of diabetics develop foot ulcers during their lifetime. With foot ulcerations, the risk of amputation goes to eightfold. An ulcer precedes amputation in 85% of the cases. And after amputation of one limb, 20% of the population, they lose their other limb in span of three years. And after amputation, two-thirds of them, they die in five years. There are very few Indian studies done on diabetic foot, and largely the studies are done by endocrinologists. One of the largest study from Dr. Vijay from Bangalore, 5516 patient across India, 30% of hospitalization were due to non-healing wound or neuropathy in diabetics. And average hospitalization was for 27 days. Friends, irony still continues that we have a very high rate of amputations among diabetics to the tune of 20 to 30%. And that matching rate in the Western world is just 2%. There are very few dedicated diabetic foot care center, and even medics and paramedics are unaware about surgical procedures which are available to correct and cure diabetic foot deformities and ulcers. Hope this information is sufficient to stimulate our medico-social obligation towards huge suffering diabetic population 
we encounter in our country who treats diabetes food this is today's burning issue and at the same time i put this statutory warning that diabetes food does not mean general surgeons traditionally in our country we submit our diabetic food cases even our other fellow consultants they submit our diabetic food cases to general surgeons but anybody who has interest desire and more importantly knowledge in the area should be treating the diabetic food so let me analyze various clinical situations which we commonly encounter in diabetic food and then how do we enter into treating this situations these two are the questionable situations cellulitis abscess necrotizing fasciitis and diabetic neuropathy these two are the zones where where i'll put question mark for an orthopedician to enter but look at this diabetic fractures diabetic ulcers deformities osteomyelitis and shark of foot this all would fall in the domain of orthopedician let's go one by one diabetic neuropathy diagnosis can be done by us if you if you are very stringent in our clinical history taking and an examination with monofilament it can also be done by the neurophysicians and physicians the pressure and gait studies are available with us orthotic and footwear prescriptions are our domain and what is most important for us is our footwear should do what foot cannot do and surgical decompressions are being thought of for the diabetic neuropathy and if it has to come it has to come in our domain only cellulitis abscess and necrotizing fasciitis commonly is treated by general surgeons but if we follow the basic principles of surgical care that it infects and traverses through the sheaths of tendon and we need radical debridement i think we can as well treat this questionable situation but then what about osteomyelitis it is one of the most dear incidents to us but we have to be aware that all x ray changes are not osteomyelitis periosteal reaction osteoporosis juxta articular cortical defects and osteolysis are common in cases like diabetic osteopathy but in sharko you would find osteopenia periarticular fragmentation which is followed by resorption of the bone and huge amount of new bone formation like this case but largely i'll put it this way presence of pain in a normally painless diabetic foot is indicative of deep infection or osteomyelitis like this and treating osteomyelitis probably is orthopedic surgeon orthopedic surgeon's birth right ulcer largely falls in our role this is what we need to learn weight bearing x rays and its analysis it is available to orthopedician only total contact cast which is the gold standard treatment for the initial cases of ulcer we need to do it we need to do it more proficiently and we do it more better than anybody else orthotics offloading footwear would be our domain correction of the deformities to relieve the pressure in cases where the ulcer is not healing in the refractory cases also is our domain we must have this sort of a stand or we must train our radiographers to take weight bearing x rays which are very very important for us to detect the weight bearing pressure areas a typical example look at this foot in a diabetic which has got a deformity which is like this and when person bear weights uh, bears weight this is where it would break and ulcer would develop total contact cast we all give the cast there is some difference with which we give total contact cast for diabetic ulcer it is not the material but it is the principle which would matter i largely follow six mantras for total contact cast the cast must not be over padded otherwise it would lead to shifting of the limb within the cast and could result into new pressure lesions into diabetic who is having loss of sensations cast must limit toe movements and prevent hyperextension of metatarsophalangeal joints cast needs high padding at the areas of pressure made by shin of tibia malleoli dorsum of toes or protuberant charcot joint and cast would need precise molding 
as per the arches of the foot, longitudinal as well as transverse arch. First cast, we need to change within five to seven days and next, subsequently you can change the cast at the interval of two to four weeks. But mind you, loose cast would be more dangerous than no cast. And last but not the least, if cast is not helping at all in the healing, you have to check, recheck. You have to stiffen the plantar walking surface with a wooden platform or a sole of a sleeper or you might have to resort to surgical offloading for shifting of the loads. Typical foot ulcer of a long duration, treated with total contact cast, it healed. The another case when I was in the uh, US doing my fellowship, antibiotics or dressings will not heal the ulcer, but it would be the offloading, may it be surgical, may it be with the orthotics, is going to heal the ulcer, so we need to use it. But if the ulcer is not healing, out of so many efforts, I think then there is an internal bone pressure which is a cause and you have to resort to surgical method of pressure relief or surgical method of deformity correction. When the situation is wherein you have got a deformed diabetic foot plus or minus ulcer, solely a domain of orthopedician. You have to diagnose it early, treat it timely so that ulcer and deformity may not coexist or ulcer may not follow the deformity. Even deformity would not allow ulcer to heal or it would lead to recurrence of the ulcer. There could be various deformity in diabetic foot like this. For the surgeries you perform, for the laser toes, the common surgery you do is percutaneous stenotomy, resection of the condyles, surgical correction of the hammer toes, excess and arthroplasty of the small joints and dorsiflexion osteotomy of the phalanges. This is how you could do condyle resection to heal the ulcer which is over this side. You could do excision arthroplasty. You could do excision arthroplasty of this joint. You could even do the osteotomy for the correction of the deformity. This is the dynamic toe deformity which was corrected in this manner. The another case which was corrected with percutaneous flexor tenotomy. This is the con which would lead to the ulcer. This was uh, treated with the metatarsal osteotomy and it healed like this. The most common ulceration you see is under the base of first metatarsophalangeal joint and there either resection of sysmoid partial or complete would help but this is the most common surgery I do in my practice that is dorsiflexion wedge correction osteotomy of the first metatarsal which would lift off the pressure over the ulcer and ulcer would heal. The principle is very simple and procedure is very simple. You are removing a dorsally, uh, dorsally based wedge and correcting the uh, 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 first metatarsal like this. This is the, this is the ulcer non-healing from about a year or so after looking after debridement. And this is how the osteotomy was done. It was corrected. I could close the ulcer. The another case of dorsiflexion wedge correction osteotomy. The another non-healing ulcer of long duration was corrected with dorsiflexion wedge osteotomy. This was the pre-op, this was the post-op. This is a very, one of the very blessing procedure which all of us should do. Again, another case. These forefoot ulcerations are accompanied with the tendo Achilles contracture. We must look for it and to deduce the forefoot pressure, we could do open or percutaneous tendo Achilles lengthening procedure together with this corrective surgery is for ulcer. Those for the midfoot, what you do is the resection of the bony prominence which is falling over the ulcer when patient bears weight, that is the exosectomy. You could also be obliged to do midfoot osteotomy or arthrodesis which is common with the Charco foot. Now look at this sort of midfoot ulceration. It is because of, there could be even deformity without ulcer, but then when you take a weight bending actually, this is the portion of the bone which is broken and which is pressing and that is resulting into the deformity as well as ulcer. And simple procedure now, this, this is how the pressure is coming on weight bearing axis. And what you need to do is you need to excise this portion like in this case, that's a pre-op, that's a post-op. Now typical midfoot uh, ulcer, non-healing, looking like this and this is how the weight bearing shows that there is a pressure 
And then through the lateral approach, it was approached, excised, and then also healed. For the deformities in the hind foot, you could do closing or opening wage osteotomies. You could put your heel into varus or valgus and you can address it with the corrective osteotomy or corrective arthrodesis. So this was a 12 years old non-healing ulcer. I'm just putting this, this is, a this is not a diabetic patient, this is a patient of leprosy. And then this is how the pressure zones were detected on foot scan. And this was the X-ray picture. The axis was like this. It was a corrective ankle fusion through transfibular approach done. This was eight weeks post-op. Ulcer started healing. And now it's four years post-op. Ulcer healed. Just correction of axis with arthrodesis. Neuropathic fractures, we have debated, we have discussed a lot about it in yesterday. It has a high complication rate like non-union, loss of fixation, wound healing issues, and progression into Charcot. And complication rate is up to, to the tune of 30 to 43 percent. You have to warn your patient and you should have very high index of suspicion for a neuropathic fracture. Now look at this uh, fracture pods. Was it innocuous? Somebody did this, it broke up and ultimately landed up like this. Now this was the patient, who pre a diabetic patient who presented to the uh, orthopedician who treated like this. He also explored the medial side, but bone broke, uh, broke down and then ultimately patient landed up into arthrodesis. This sort of arthrodesis was done. It also failed and ultimately I had to do uh, this sort of fusion. So it healed after about seven surgeries. You have to be watchful for neuropathic fracture. Another neuropathic ankle fracture, which was stabilized like this. A neuropathic calcaneal fracture, wherein the fracture was here and I opted to bridge, I opted to bridge the calcaneal cuboid joint, even the subtalar joint to give the stability. I said that for the neuropathic fracture, what you need is to cross the joint, span the joint, use multiple fixation, augment the stability of your fixation, use longer, larger implants, extend the immobilization, extend the non-weight bearing and protect it by, by the braces. Sharko is solely our demand, may it be bracing, may it be arthrodesis, various kind of conservative care, we know it and we can do it better. And then if you want to do surgery, we know that, orthopedician know that, Achilles lengthening is important. We could do arthrodesis, osteotomies, wedge corrections, and fix it rigidly with screw plates, rods, or even Elizaro frames. So these are the few midfoot charco cases operated with multiple implants. This is the hind foot charco, multiple implants, stronger fixation, longer stabilization. Amputations, which is also another clinical uh, situation which is encountered in diabetic foot, can be done by general surgeons, vascular surgeons, and even by us. But prosthetic prescription, training of the prosthesis, and care of the prosthesis are better done by us, and rehabilitation of amputee is solely our domain. So these, what I listed, were the common situations which we encounter in diabetic foot. But now let me list down the tools which you need to deal with this diabetic foot issues. Offloading orthotics, total contact cast, offloading surgeries, prosthesis, prevention, rehabilitation, weight bearing x-rays, and foot lab. I talked about these two, quickly talking about these three things. You can assess it by the monofilament, a very simple test to detect neuropathy. And in your foot lab, you could have a biothesiometer to detect the uh, various zones a vascular Doppler could have a crude measurement of diabetic foot pressure areas by Harris Matt. And if you want to go in for sophisticated instrument, you can go in for a foot scan, which would analyze the gait pattern and the pressure which is coming on, uh, on, on an area of a diabetic patient, high pressure zone, then you need to offload either surgically or by the orthotics. Friends, prevention as well plays most important role. It can be done best by the person who deals with the majority of the clinical situation. I am selling this point to every orthopedic surgeon and, and all those orthopedic surgeons 
who want to get, in, get indulged into foot and ankle practice to start with diabetic foot school, which could be a concept where we would gather the diabetics and talk about the problems of the diabetic foot and then solutions which are available to it. It would be a huge service to the society and in turn you are also going to brand yourself. That's what we do here in our, uh, our foot and ankle center. We do foot schools in a huge number every fortnightly Sunday wherein we talk to the diabetic patient at length about this thing. So friends, at the end of my talk, who else than orthopedician is equipped with all these tools? I think it is only orthopedician who can give utmost care for prevention of ulcer, he can prescribe suitable orthotics, he can offload the pressure areas, he can correct the soft tissue imbalance, orthopedician can do bony procedures for offloading and excess correction for mechanical this thing. So friends, let God shower mercy on general surgeons so that they recognize that there is a limitation for them to go underneath the problem. Thank you very much. Uh, one more announcement. Uh, we do Indo-US foot and ankle course every year. These courses are done for three days in January and in June we do it for two days. These courses essentially are with about 70-75 lectures. We demonstrate 12 surgeries. We have three, four workshops. Anybody who is interested into having a thorough in-depth knowledge into foot and ankle is invited to join at Jaipur next month, 10th, 11th, 12th, where we are having this Indo-US, fifth Indo-US foot and ankle course. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Shah. As I said to you, that was a fire and brimstone advertisement for orthopedic surgeons' involvement in uh, di diabetes. <coughs> Can I... Uh, open the house for questions. We want to have a short question and answer session before we go on to the ankle arthritis subsection of this session. Any questions, please? No, this is typically applied with that ulcer on. Yeah. That is the concept that you do the dressing, you put a dressing, and you apply a cast. That's what I said in my presentation, that you have to cover the ulcer, you apply the cast, you allow patient to walk on the cast, that is also permissible. You mold the cast as per the arches of the foot and you prevent hyperextension of the toes. So you are covering or you are correcting the deforming force. And then every week you go on changing the cast, at the end of four or five weeks you will find that ulcer heals. So it's the dissipation of the pressure that is the principle. Sorry. Uh, yes, you always look for the vascularity in diabetic foot, and then uh, there was one line that if uh, there is a compromised vascularity, vascular surgeon may be involved he might do some procedure to give you increase into the vascularity. Sorry, before, before Mark asks his question, can I just throw a different paradigm to you, Dr. Shah? Um, in the UK, the current concept, the model that works very well to a large extent for us is that a diabetic foot ulcer is but a manifestation of a systemic met metabolic disease, and it is universally accepted in the, in the British community that this has to be treated by a multimodal team. It has to be, it's a team effort, and the responsibility for the patient is largely held by the endocrinologist, the diabetologist, because the behavior of, of uh, such ulcers is often governed by their glycemic status. And you have, for example, in my hospital, I have a, a multidisciplinary clinic, an all-day diabetic clinic once a month, whereby you have vascular surgeons, um, orthopedic surgeons, you have pain specialists to deal with painful neuropathy, 
you have plastic surgical colleagues, you have podiatrists, you have orthotists. It's a huge team. And, and, and you know, perhaps it may not be a workable model in India at the moment, but certainly uh, there will be no orthopedic surgeon in the UK who will say, I will see every diabetic foot ulcer, because that'll, that's all we'll be doing. We won't have time to do anything else. Yeah. So this is just a different twist on no, your philosophy. Yeah. No, no. The issue is we also have a multidisciplinary uh, approach to the diabetic foot. But traditionally, uh, the other consultants as well as orthopedician, we ought to neglect this. We feel that this is not our armamentarium. This is not falling in our arm. So my whole idea of talk or the focus of the talk was to stimulate people that, yes, this is our area and we also need to do a lot about it. Dr. Shah, thank you for a very inspiring talk. Um, do you dis differentiate between doing a, a hokey Achilles tendon lengthening and just simply trying to address a gastrocnemius? Do you feel there's a role in, in differentiating between doing the different techniques? Yeah. See, it's, uh, I mean, for the want of time, I did not elaborate it onto it. But then you need to make sure that whether you're dealing with the gastro contracture or you're dealing with gastrocnemius as well as soleus contraction. The test is very simple. You examine the dorsiflexion in uh, 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 knee straight and knee bent to 90 degrees. And then you come to know which element is dominant. Accordingly, you could do for gastrorecession procedure or you could do triple hemirecession uh, tendo Achilles lengthening. But the uh, moral of the uh, story is that you need that. You have to look out for relieving the forefoot pressure by tendo Achilles tightness, relieving the tendo Achilles tightness. When you decide for amputation? I'm sorry? When you decide for amputation? I, well, it's, it's rather a very wide question to answer. Uh, not largely for the diabetic ulcer, you are going to resort to the amputation. But maybe in Sharko, if the foot is not braceable, foot is not swayable, the vascularity is compromised, and person has got a lot of comorbid conditions, he cannot withstand or undergo uh, so many number of surgeries, or he has not that desire to, you know, go for the surgery. Therein, balancing amputation vis a -vis, multiple surgeries, long immobilization, long non weight bearing would make sense. So it is a case-based approach. It's not a uh, sort of uh, uh, tailor-plated approach that for this sort of cases, you go in for amputation. But I do agree at certain juncture, amputation would be a better option than trying to save the limb. OK. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shah. I think we'll we'll move speedily on to our, our next talk, uh, which is going to be given by uh, uh, Trish Allen on the assessment of a patient with ankle arthritis. Right, thank, thank you very much. I'm going to talk uh, purely about the uh, clinical assessment of uh, 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 ankle and hind foot arthritis uh, and then hand over to uh, Jit Mangwani. So the objectives, the aims of what we're going to do now is really um, have an understanding, therefore, of how the hind foot works and relates to the forefoot, have an approach to the assessment of a patient with possible ankle and hind foot arthritis, and, and then the bit about choosing appropriate investigations and be able to formulate a treatment plan is going to be covered um, in uh, Jit Mangwani's talk. So what are we dealing with? This question that uh, in the UK, UK we often have of uh, referral from the general practitioner, please see this, uh, this guy who's got a painful right ankle with arthritis. But when I see a letter like that, it doesn't really tell me a huge amount other than the patient's got some pain somewhere around the hind foot or ankle, and I'm not really sure what the underlying pathology uh, is. 
So what's going through my mind about what might be wrong with the patient when I first see them and when I start to actually take the history? What am I thinking? Is this some form of underlying hind foot joint disease? Is it actually something to do with the tendons around the back of the foot? Have they got what we talked about this morning, a stress fracture or a Charcot type arthropathy? Have they got some form of pathology associated with accessory bones and spurs, the ostrigonum, accessory navicular, or some form of hind foot coalition? Or is it something that is referred to the foot, something from the back, they've got some form of radiculopathy? So there's a lot of things that, that actually the patient may have that actually the, the referral letter really tells you nothing about. When we look specifically at hind foot joint disease, we're obviously talking about osteoarthritis, but not just of the ankle. The problem with, with uh, pain is obviously it's exactly where the pain is felt. And we talked a lot yesterday about where pain is, is felt. Uh, and it's very important when we see a patient to know where their pain is. But what I'm thinking about is whether we, we know that it may be the ankle, but we know that the tendon of joint is very close to it. So this could be arthritis of any of the hind foot joints. You can get obviously primary osteoarthritis, but most of the osteoarthritis that we see of the uh, ankle is post-traumatic. Some of it is secondary to uh, chronic instability, and some due to the end stage deformity of either a plane of algus foot or sometimes a cave of varus foot. We obviously see a reasonable amount of uh, inflammatory arthropathy with rheumatoid arthritis, etc. Some may be secondary to uh, an osteochondral lesion, and then there's the odd rarities that can cause osteoarthritis pigmented nodular synovitis or uh, haemophilia and haemophiliac arthropathy. So just to go quickly back about where uh, ankle and hind foot pain is felt. So ankle pain is very specifically um, over the front of the ankle here. Subtalar pain felt more laterally around the sinus tarsi, but with some pain medially over the medial facet where the sustentaculum is. Tail of joint just that little bit lower and calcaneal cuboid obviously uh, more uh, laterally. So as we said, the vast majority of ankle arthritis that we see, the underlying etiology is post-traumatic, so you want to know about whether they've had uh, any form of, uh, of trauma. Obviously, um, if they have uh, an underlying inflammatory arthropathy, and what's therefore important then is what drugs they're on. So we know that the immunosuppressive drugs, and particularly anti-TNF, will have a bearing on what we may or may not be able to do to the patient. There is a small percentage that are uh, primary, and then there is the group of uh, uh, neuropathic, and then the, the uh, rarities. But don't forget that some patients that present with a primary arthritis do have, do have sepsis, and particularly things like TB can present as a primary ankle arthritis. Oh. So when we're taking history, what do you want to know? You want to know what their problem is. Where is their pain? Most of this is going to be pain. Where it is, when they've got it, is it just at rest, uh, sorry, just on activity, is it at rest, do they have night pain? And whilst, you, obviously, what you're trying to think about at that point in time is what's the likely cause of their symptoms. Do they have multi-joint disease? Because that will obviously have a bearing on what you may do. Is it purely the ankle? Is it the ankle and the subtalar joint? Or is it pantalar arthritis around the whole of the hind foot? Do they also have something else wrong in the forefoot? Or have they got uh, deformity or uh, pain in the more proximal joints? We want to know about their medical comorbidities. We've already talked, you've just heard about diabetes, which obviously has a bearing, and certainly has a bearing on the decision-making process in terms of what we may decide to do or not to do uh, with it. You want to know about what the patient's expectations are. Patients come to you expecting something. Often they come to you as a surgeon expecting surgery, but actually that may not necessarily be the most appropriate thing for them. But you want to know what they want and what they want to achieve. By and large, what a patient wants is relief of pain. How you get there, that doesn't in a way necessarily, they don't, that's not their focus. What they want is, is relief of pain. You obviously also want to know if they've had any other treatment and what they've had so that you know about what previous surgery, et cetera, they've had. So by the end of the history, you should have a really good working diagnosis of what the diagnosis is how bad it is to that patient, but also what your patient's like in terms of what they want. How active are they? How active do they want to be? What their job is and whether they are on their feet all day, whether they're climbing ladders and things, whether that, you know, particularly if we've got a farming community around us. So therefore, how much they want to do with their foot and ankle, which again will have a bearing on what my decision-making process will be in terms of what I do with them. 
examination will tell you what you want obviously we're going to look we've talked about yesterday about how we look around the ankle and the hind foot the alignment swellings and scars you want to obviously examine these specific joints for tenderness and synovitis and then we want to look at the range of movement how much movement particularly at the ankle uh, how much movement they've got if the ankle is very stiff that may have a very great bearing on what you do as will it be if you've got if the whole hind foot is stiff because that may you may want to retain movement if at all possible there in those instances obviously which joints are then the ones that are irritable in terms of special tests by and large, with uh, ankle um, arthritis, they're not all uh, unstable, but some of them will have pure anterior impingement, will just have pain at the extremes of uh, dorsiflexion, and will not have global joint disease. And obviously, the stability of the ankle. So examination tells us about the structure and uh, functional abnormalities that the patient uh, has. It gives you an idea about what the foot is like, what the underlying shape of the foot is, and the category of any pre-existing deformity, i.e. is it cavus, is it a uh, flat foot, is there an underlying neurological uh, uh, disease, which obviously has a bearing on your treatment plan. Tells you, you need to know what's happening with the regional tissues. We've talked about diabetes. You obviously want to know if the, what the skin quality is like. Post-traumatic arthritis often can have quite significant scarring, etc., which will have a bearing on where your incisions are or whether you indeed want to make many incisions and whether you want to do something more minimally invasive around the hind foot uh, and ankle. Uh, clearly, also the, uh, the vascular and uh, sensory as uh, supply to your skin you want to know you obviously need a good vascular status if you're going to think about doing something surgical to them but it will also tell you about their general health and mobility you, obviously because that gain has a bearing on what you are going to do you want to know whether your suspicion from the history are, are correct you want to know by the end of the examination you should, ha should have a really clear working diagnosis so that when you come on to uh, examination that you, you, you uh, sorry in, in terms of investigation they're there to confirm or refute your provisional diagnosis the investigations therefore get to what is going to help you you need to pick the investigations that will help you clarify the the, pro, the diagnosis and choose a management plan I'm going to hand over now to uh, Jit who's going to talk about the investigations about what we are then going to do so hopefully we have an approach so that we know what investigations to choose and formulate a treatment plan for both non-surgical and surgical treatment. So in summary, you want to know, because we want to know that we're going to treat what the patient's problems are. So we need a careful clinical assessment and then Jit's going to tell us about the choice of imaging. And I'll abandon that one. Thanks, Trish. Um, I'll just load my presentation. Should go smoothly on, hopefully. Okay, um, I'm Jit Mangwani. Obviously, we're now into the ankle arthritis, and um, we're trying to make some sense out of various options, various options available to um, manage ankle arthritis. So look at the options um, as I go along. Uh, I'll start with some radiology first and try and see if we can order some um, plain radiographs um, which will tell us what the uh, state of arthritis is and also what sort of series do you need and then we we'll move on to a bit more specialist investigation and then look at the options for our treatment of the arthritis, both non-operative and operative, um, and then move on from there. So Trish has already covered uh, epidemiology, and I'm gonna, not going to dwell too much on that. It is post-traumatic, so the soft tissues are different to what your idiopathic arthritis around your hip and knee is, very different to hip and knee arthritis. It is your young patient who gets this post-traumatic arthritis, so the age population you're dealing with is different as well. So you, all that has a bearing on your management. So imaging, standard imaging is your AP lateral, and as Dr. Shah has emphasized a couple of times, it's your weight-bearing AP lateral. So there's a take-home message. If you do 
non-made bearing X-rays for foot and ankle, I think you should move away from that completely and go for an AP lateral. Um, so, so not only your ankle joint, you should be looking at other joints underneath. So you can see the subtalar joint there. You can see posterior facet looks a little bit arthritic there. Are your other joints doing okay? So telenavicular and calcaneal cuboid. You, if you are looking at a good, uh, if you're looking at uh, a big sort of hind foot deformity, um, a Kobe view is one of the other ways to look at it. So you see the, how much barus is there in that heel. And on your normal AP view, you won't be able to pick that up. So we move on to CT. And CT is essentially to uh, differentiate, particularly if you've got ankle arthritis and you're not sure on your clinical exam that it, how much of the pain is coming from it. Um, there is some degenerative changes on the posterior facet. Um, do I do a CT? I think it does give you some idea. Look at the joint um, surface there with lots of cysts, clearly very arthritic and not so bad underneath. So it kind of reassures you that subtalar joint is okay. When do you do MRI scan? Um, it's to look at the rest of the soft tissues. You've got uh, ligaments, your tendons, um, and ankle arthritis may coexist with some of that pathology. Um, you also can see synovitis. This is only six, seven months down the line from somebody who was treated non-operatively uh, with, um, for a trimalleolar fracture. Um, and you can see some con early chondrolysis. If they're having persistent pain after your ankle fracture management, you might want to look at uh, an MRI. Um, when you're not sure whether it's subtalar joint or ankle joint, I think this is one or more than one joint sometimes. Um, you, this is a good way of sort of, kind of trying to differentiate. Um, and studies have confirmed that if you are, if your patient's pain is relieved by uh, an intraarticular injection, then it will be better with your arthrodesis. Uh, sorry, I had to take that picture from internet. It's not, not one of mine. Um, so we'll look at the classification. Does it have a bearing on your management? I think this one from Nick Van Dyke's unit uh, more than 10 years ago, it's quite simple to understand that you got stage one where you got some osteophytes where the joint space is still okay. Um, you got two where you got joint space narrowing with or without osteophytes. So it's in the joint that you're looking at. And the, the third one is your proper sort of, you know, where you got everything, total disappearance, and then some deformity developing in, uh, through the joint. Now, this is more sort of comprehensive Canadian Orthopedic Foot and Ankle Society classification. And this essentially is, is it all in the ankle joint? Is there any intra-articular pathology uh, which, which is sort of causing deformity, whereas or valgus? Um, is it outside of your ankle joint, that deformity? And then it could be with other joints surrounding the ankle joint. Okay, so non-operative treatment, essentially it applies to all of your patients. So it's a starting point for all ankle patients uh, who've got arthritis in their joints. So healthy diet, uh, body weight. I think smoking, you, you've got to think very carefully in your history, as Trish has uh, elaborated previously as well. You really have to look at, if you're thinking of a joint fusion, uh, smoking, there's good evidence out there saying smoking it's not good for those patients to so try and get them to stop smoking uh, and try and convert them into some non-impact exercises like cycling, swimming, etc. Non-steroidals for any kind of arthritis, um, you know, it's well established. You unload the joint by various means. You can put steroid injections for temporary relief and also for differentiating where the pain is coming from. Let's look at some of the other um, agents, so chondroprotective agents, essentially mainly all of the research is in um, knee OA. There's only one study in ankle OA with a very, very uh, short follow-up. So whether they are beneficial or not, as any, you, know, it's, you can't be sure. Uh, what about visco supplementation? There's a variety of stuff that people have injected um, into the ankle joint, as you can see, all those. And, and if you look at the follow-up, none of these are long-term follow-up or medium-term follow-up. You're looking at really six to 18 months. And they're comparing physiotherapy within, uh, with a visco supplementation, most of them. Um, so where do we stand with that? We essentially stand with, okay, well, you can think of it. It is safe. Um, there are no big comparative studies. Which one of those do you use? I have no idea. 
number of injections, some say three, some say five, some say one is enough. And do you use it in early or late uh, away? And we really don't have any long-term results on that. So what am I thinking now? I'm thinking surgery as one of the options. And when I'm sur considering surgery, I think you've got to look at all of the stuff that Trish has covered. You know, your patient factors are really important in deciding what are you going to do with your surgery. Um, then you look at the local factors from after your general factors, you look at the local factors where you've got your soft tissue envelope. Is there previous metal work? Because majority of these are post-traumatic. How's the bony anatomy? Is there a malalignment? Or have I got enough bone stock? And which stage of OA is it? So, so dividing those in joint preserving and joint sacrificing as two big options, really. We look at joint preserving first. And these are your options for joint preserving. And I'll try and go through those. Some of them really are not in my routine practice, things like allograft. Um, so we'll touch on that, but I think it's largely for centers who are doing some research on these things. So where does the ankle scope fit into this? If you've got an anterior osteophyte um, and it's impinging, you can take that off. If you've got a loose body, you can take that off. A localized chondral defect, you can uh, debride. But this is not for advanced OA. You shouldn't stick a scope in, in somebody who's got a grade uh, three OA and thinking you're going to get them better. Where does your peritaylor osteotomy sit? So if the deformity is supramalleolar, you're going to think of supramalleolar osteotomy. If it's down here in the heel, you're going to think of 